Hello again and hope everyone is well. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope you're well. Um, I'm really excited to be welcoming you to Eco Business's first lunch and learn session. My name is Ilya Rahan. I am the research and consulting manager at Eco Business. And I'm very pleased to be moderating a new monthly series that we're kicking off today. Now the format of this Lunch and Learn series, which takes place at the start of each month, is a relaxed one hour chat with subject matter experts on exciting developments and innovations happening in the world of sustainability. Today's theme will be on food and agri agriculture technology, which can be a mouthful, so we'll shorten it to agri-tech. And I'll be speaking to three experts on some of the most exciting innovations and solutions being developed to meet the urgent yet mightily complicated need of feeding the world. We will hear about how new industries in, um, in this space is revolutionizing agriculture, one of the oldest industries in human civilization. We'll hear about how farmers, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, governments and nonprofits are collaborating to solve the mounting challenges in agriculture and to feed the world that is made worse by climate change, the pandemic and a whole host of other factors. And we'll hear about the rise of alternative proteins and whether consumers are becoming more open to trying out the many options sold on the shelves of supermarkets. Next slide, Ben. Now today's topic is one of three themes in the livability challenge um, that is proudly uh, organized by EcoBusiness um, in conjunction with EcoSperity. Um, and this is our fifth year holding this competition. Um, it's a global initiative that looks for and accelerates the adoption of innovative solutions to urban challenges of the 21st century in cities in the tropics. It crowdsources the world for the best sustainability solutions and provides both the monetary and ecosystem support needed to take these ideas from laboratory to commercialization at the market scale. Now for food and agri-tech, where our global food security and quality of food is under stress, some of the solutions the livability challenge hopes to see ranges from um, plant-based foods that can increase production while maintaining a low carbon footprint to solutions that reduce food waste and even new foods that provide healthier alternatives for consumers. In our past editions, for example, in the 2021 challenge, um, uh, the winner was Sea Change for their technology to convert dissolved carbon dioxide in seawater into stable solid carbonates, which can be used to make construction materials such as concrete and cement. In, 2020, in 2020, um, Turtle Tree Labs was, a, was the winner for its innovative lab-grown milk as an alternative to cow milk. So if you, or if you know someone who has an idea to address these issues in our food system, I would urge that idea to be submitted for a chance to make a huge impact in the cities. Your idea could be the next big thing to win a million dollars. And I see that, um, Jean, thank you for putting in the, the link to the livability challenge. Next slide, Ben. Thank you. Now, before we begin the discussion, I would really like to set the stage with some context, highlighting how agriculture is um, at the center of numerous global challenges. We're currently facing a challenge to meet a very basic human need, and that's to feed ourselves and our loved ones. Um, we'll need to feed a population of nearly 10 billion people, as predicted by the FAO, um, a population of nearly 10 billion people by 2050, with some estimates requiring a 60 to 100% increase in the global food production patterns. The pressures of food demand are predicted to further intensify by consumption trends, especially the, the demand for milk, meat, eggs, and this will be further accelerated by the growth in the middle class, particularly in emerging markets. The ability of farmers to meet this global food demand will be limited by water availability, um, declining soil quality, and the impact of climate change. So the challenge here is really how do we grow more crops efficiently while using less land and fewer natural resources. 
changes in climate patterns will create a more unpredictable environment for farming with volatile shifts in rainfall and weather patterns and changes in insect distribution behavior, which will impact the, the crop yields. And then finally, on top of the, those impacts, the, the pandemic has exposed the weak links in our agri-food supply chains, placing enormous stress because of bottlenecks in farm labor, transport, and logistics. So these intersecting factors will require significant increases in productivity and, um, uh, and, and this will be supported by R&D investments and increased collaborations across agricultural and food sectors. Um, our, finally, our chat with the experts, and I'm, I'm really delighted to, um, I'm hoping the, the speakers can maybe turn on the cameras. Perfect, great. Um, so let me just start with a brief introduction of, of who our experts are. I'm very delighted to welcome Matthew Pryor. He is the co-founder of Tenacious Ventures, a venture capital firm that supports early stage agri-food innovators and invests in the food and agriculture sectors. Um, Shuli Go, a policy specialist for the Good Food Institute, a global nonprofit that promotes plant and cell-based alternatives to animal protein. And Christine Guo, founder and CEO of Thought for Food, a global innovation engine that empowers, supports, and fosters collaboration for the next generation of leaders to solve our food supply problems. So I'll, I'll start with asking our experts to share their insights and thoughts on the rise of food engineering and agri-tech. And I would really like to encourage the audience to ask any questions that they have in the chat box. So um, maybe we'll start with, with, a, with an introduction. Um, and uh, my first question is that uh, food and agriculture technology is a very dynamic area with new in innovations emerging at a rapid pace to reinvent farming and, and solve the, the food security and quantity problem. In two minutes, can you tell us a bit more um, about your role in food and agri-tech? And I will uh, maybe ask Matthew to, to start first. I like the time limit, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, look, thanks for the opportunity. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, wherever you happen to be. Yeah, look, at Tenacious Ventures, um, we, we partner with a, a core group we call AgTech operators who are seeking to unlock uh, world-changing impact at the intersection of what we refer to as digitally native agriculture and climate solutions. And when we say partnering, that takes kind of two key forms. The first kind is partnering, backing early stage startups who are building tomorrow's agri-food system, but at the same time, building communities around the agri-food system where change agents are reimagining value chains today. And so sort of by working at both ends of the barbell, so to speak, um, you know, those two key interventions really are about this enormous transformation that you highlighted uh, that our global food system has to go through. Thank you so much for that brief introduction. Um, I will ask, maybe pass the mic to Shuli. Yep. Thanks, Ili. And thanks to EcoBusiness for inviting GFI to the panel. So I'm Shuli from uh, GFI APEC, uh, also known as the Good Food Institute Asia Pacific. Um, what we do is that we're actually part of an international network of nonprofit organizations working to develop an ecosystem for a more sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. Um, we do um, three main pillars of work. So just to break it down, um, very briefly, our corporate and innovation um, pillar focuses on connecting students, startups, and investors to provide open access market and consumer insights on the evolving all protein space. Our SciTech team, the science and technology team, they work with experts in the field and they also produce scientific research and expertise to plug in the knowledge gaps in the all proteins field. And the policy wing, which is where I'm at, focusing on APEC. Um, me and the rest of my uh, global affiliates, we work to, with governments to ensure a clear regulatory pathway for all proteins to secure public funding and support for R&D for all proteins. And we also work with multinational organizations like the United Nations, FAO and the WHO to put food on the global agenda when we talk about sustainability. Thank you. Great, thanks. And I think that point on um, working with uh, different sectors, that's something that I'll definitely touch on and ask uh, more about later on. Um, I'll pass the mic out now to Christine to introduce herself. 
Hi, everyone. This is Christine Gould. I am in the very early morning hours here in Switzerland. It's 5 a.m. So, but what a delight to start my day um, on such an important topic and a region of the world that um, is so exciting to, to see what's going on with food and agri-tech. Um, I am the founder and CEO of an organization called Thought for Food. I started my organization after spending my entire career in agriculture, most recently at a large agribusiness. Um, and what we do is really focus on catalyzing new innovation by focusing our efforts on the next generations of innovators, specifically, you know, that under 40 innovator all over the world. We work with a global community of 30K plus in 170 countries. We um, leverage a process of global collaboration for local impact and have launched around 70 startups to date with three full exits. Um, but startup acceleration and support isn't just what we do. We're also engaging, you know, a new generation into the challenges that we face when it comes to feeding the world, helping them to live true to their values and ways of working so that those can be carried forward so that we can change the system. And lastly, we work with you know, leaders, incumbents from corporate, as well as those um, organizations like the United Nations, where I had the chance to join the advisory board last year for the UN Food System Summit. And we're trying to really, you know, again, shift the system um, through innovation. And that is kind of engagement, acceleration, and connections and investment. Great. I really, thank you so much, Christina. I really like how um holistic and diverse um, that the experts' um, uh, experiences are, and, and I think they'll contribute to a very uh, engaging discussion. So, um, Christine, I think I'll direct the first question to you. Mm -hmm. um, so, as an innovation platform for um, food and agriculture, uh, you know, Thought for Food, you work with a lot of different stakeholders um, to, to find the solutions. Um, can you tell us more about some of the latest developments and trends that you're seeing in, in food and agri-tech? What's, what's exciting? What's happening out there? Yeah, well, this is certainly like one of the most exciting sectors to be part of right now. And this wasn't the case, you know, about 10 years ago when I started Thought for Food. This was seen as an outdated sector with no prospects. And, you know, the company that I worked for um, was actually like divested from a pharma company because, you know, nobody wanted to be part of agriculture. But what we've seen in the past 10 years is a rapid acceleration of, um, you know, interest in this sector. Um, and it's been really exciting to see and to be part of that, actually. And you have an amazing panel of people who are helping to shape and lead, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing. And I think there's some obvious spaces I could talk about, such as alternative proteins, you know, such as ag tech and precision ag. And of course, like use leveraging um, breakthrough technologies, AI, machine learning, SynBio, and now like Web3 and blockchain are coming into the space. But I, what I wanted to talk about a little bit in relation to this question is that um, one of the trends that I think is really important to talk about, too, is the fact that agriculture is a very complex um, sector. Uh, we talk about a food system. And actually that is like very emblematic of how we've like solved problems in the industrial era through optimization and efficiencies. But actually what we have is food systems that are, you know, locally contextual and are related to um, each other and interacting with each other, but are also related to and interacting with all kinds of other systems that we have, climate systems, economic systems, political systems. I mean, food is really like at the core and affected by and affecting all of these systems. So a trend that I'm seeing is, of course, all of those technologies and spaces that I mentioned earlier, but through the next generation being looked at in a systemic way. So it's not just all proteins, it's going beyond the Beyond Burger, actually. It's not just all proteins for all protein sake. It's like, how do we incorporate underutilized crops? How do we empower smallholders? How do we make technology inclusive as we're bringing forward new solutions in these spaces? Um, and, you know, flipping dilemmas that have existed in the past. How do we build right-sized technologies that can reach more farmers and include them, you know, as part of the uh, you know, user experiences as, as technologies are being developed. So I just wanted to mention that I think like there's obvious trends, but where the sector is going is to build these right size solutions that are relevant to their local context and incorporating more systemic and if you will, regenerative and sustainability principles throughout every part of that innovation cycle. 
but that's going to be really hard. Um, you know, while we're seeing an increase in interest in that from the innovation side, investors, I think, still have a way to go to see how to invest in these types of solutions that maybe have impact at the fore, um, as well as the opportunity for great returns. But I think there's going to be a little bit of a challenge there to, to and make these investable opportunities um, as quickly as they need to be. Great. That's, that's, um, thank you so much for that detailed um, response. I, I really like how you touched on the intersectionality of um, food systems or, um, yeah, food systems, because we, we forget about how many layers there are in, in the context um, aspect and how that impacts the, the farmers as well. Um, you touched something very um, relevant that I was going to ask in my next question about the finance and the capital element. And um, this next question is for Matthew. Um, so, uh, you, you know, Tenacious Ventures, it's a it's an Australian venture capital firm that invests in agri-tech startups dedicated to improving, um, finding those solutions. Maybe you can tell us more about uh, what sort of startups you have worked with and, you know, what are some of the main problems you're hoping to solve? And, and this could be very unique to the Australian context as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, actually. Uh, and definitely acknowledging Christine's point there about the challenges in the intersection of kind of the typical venture model and, and what's really required in, in agri-food. And that's why we like being a sector specific investor because we think that that, that requirement of kind of spending 100% of our time uh, in the agri-food systems um, is, is necessary. We, we think about it uh, at that very sort of early stage investor and that very early stage we think about it in identifying pathways. And whilst we are Australian based, we're not Australian focused. So we invest significantly in Australian originated companies, but they're all looking at global problems. And so we think about pathways, the, the pathways with, that we think about uh, creation and, and uh, enablement for uh, things like waste and resource recovery, what we call digitized biology, democratized infrastructure, uh, enhanced natural capital, embedded risk and finance, sustainable protein, uh, and lower intensity production. And so, those are kind of investment themes, if you like, and companies that we invest in touch on kind of one or all of those. Um, so our, our very first investment, a company called Coterra, has a modular distributed biological process for processing organic waste. Um, so there are these magical boxes full of black, black soldier fly that can be put where waste is and process that into something that's valuable downstream, but, but solve yeah, so that in terms of waste and resource recovery, that's really interesting, but also in terms of distributed infrastructure, right? When we talk about this concept of a digitally native agriculture, you know, if you look around at agriculture now, a lot of it is the size that it is because of the industrial era. You know, grain silos are this big and processing facilities are that size. Uh, and so we imagine these new pathways and they're enabled by technology clearly. Um, and, you know, so Swarm Farm Robotics, which is an autonomous vehicle platform for farming, yes, it's true, there's autonomy there. And so that's about efficiency and things like that. But it's also about minimizing the emissions intensity of agriculture, lowering the amount of synthetic chemistry that's used, lowering the amount of nitrogen that's applied, because you can act with just a completely different level of precision when you're autonomous, when you're a smaller form factor, when you can spend you know, a day doing something that a person doing it could only afford two hours to do. Uh, and so that's really what drives our kind of early stage investing is thinking about those new pathways that need to be created and, and really ones that are enabled by this idea of digitally native agriculture and are targeted squarely at delivering climate solutions. That's really interesting. I think the, the point on um, digital native agriculture, that's something that I've been noticing a lot. Um, you know, for example, if you look at China and India, there's there's so much activity going on there with um, trying to come up with agri-tech solutions, you know, employing mobile applications, using geodata, satellite tracking, and, um, you know, tracking soil and water input. So um, it's really exciting. It's, it's very fragmented. And I think I'm sure we can touch more on that later on. Um, but first, I will uh, just uh, pivoting a little bit to Shuli. Um, and and uh, my question for you is that, uh, you know, a key focus area of 
uh, the Good Food Institute is to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and, and of course, delicious. Um, and there's been a huge expansion in the types of, of alternative proteins being made available. You've got plant-based, cultivated, cell-based, um, and it can be quite intimidating and confusing. Um, I know for myself, when I go grocery shopping, um, and I look at the ingredients and I, it, it's, it's overwhelming. So maybe you can set the record straight and explain to the audience some of the more common types of, of alternative proteins. Yeah, I'm sure. So when we talk about alternative proteins, there are three uh, main types of alternative proteins. The first would be plant-based proteins. The second would be cultivated meat or proteins. And the third would be fermentation and able proteins. So if we start off with plant-based proteins, there are proteins like uh, meat, eggs, dairy, they are plant-based, and they mimic the taste and texture of animal-based products. So these plant-based proteins can be soy-based, or they could be made from nuts, chickpeas, other bean types, or even seaweed and algae. And several of these products can actually already be found on our supermarket shelves. For example, in Singapore, if you go to Xingxiang or you go to Cold Storage, regardless of where you go, there would be uh, plant-based meats like Impossible Meat and Beyond Burger that's already available. And uh, if we move on to cultivated meat, these are basically meats that are grown from cells taken from animals. So for example, a cultivated chicken is uh, made of cells from the chicken without harming any chickens in the process. So um, I think this, is, this, um, this type of alternative protein is the least understood. So I'll just give a quick elaboration of how it's made. So with the technology that we have today, we can actually grow animal cells in a device known as a cultivator. And this cultivator will basically provide the conditions and the elements needed to build muscle. And it enables the natural process of cell growth, but in a more efficient rate and without any animal slaughter. So the result is that cultivated meat can look and taste and even cook like conventional meat that we have been eating all along, but without the pathogens and other contaminants and also with a much smaller environmental footprint. So as we all know, Singapore is currently the only country in the world that has granted regulatory approval to sell cultivated meat commercially. So that's very exciting. And we're very happy that Singapore is being the front runner in this arena. Um, lastly, I mentioned fermentation and apoproteins. proteins. Um, there are many types of fermentation. So just to uh, drill down to three main kinds, there's traditional fermentation. We can think of tempeh, beer, and wine. They're made through um, traditional fermentation. There is biomass fermentation. So if we go to the supermarket, we find corn nuggets, which are made from microprotein. And uh, there's also precision fermentation. So for precision fermentation, it's not really to produce an, a product per se, but it's to produce specific proteins, enzymes, flavors, and pigments that could enhance an existing product rather than being a core product on its own. So I hope that was helpful. That's super helpful. It's, it's, it's a great um, introduction to all the different types. And um, a follow-up question for you, Shuli, is um, whether, you know, can you explain how these alternative proteins is better for, for the environment and, and also human health? I think there's been a lot of discourse in recent years, um, a lot of debate whether it's actually better for humans and whether it's better for the environment, like we could actually be using more inputs um, to, to, to create them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on that. Definitely. So the, the alternate protein space is very nice and so it's in, at, at its initial stages. So what you mentioned earlier about needing more resources, that is definitely true, especially for cultivated meat. And um, I think to do a comparison, we got to look at the current food system, which is responsible for 34% of global greenhouse emissions. And half of these emissions actually come from just producing protein alone. And the current system is not only land intensive and water intensive, there's also a high risk of um, spreading and developing zoonotic diseases, which means diseases that spread from infected animals to humans. If we look into the future, um, we know that global protein demand is set to rise in Asia alone. Just looking at our region, the appetite for meat and seafood has been projected to increase by another 70 plus percent in the next few decades to 2050. And this will continue contributing to deforestation, water depletion, and massive greenhouse emissions, which the other speakers also mentioned earlier. And where does alternative proteins come in? When we conducted some life cycle assessments with our partners on plant-based meats, it shows that plant-based meats can have the potential to require up to 90% less land than conventional meat production. It also emits up to 90% less greenhouse gases and uses up to 99% less water than conventional meat production. So that's just from the sustainability perspective. And if we talk about the public health perspective, 
um, we look at how animals are being raised today to feed um, the human population. So these animals are raised in confined conditions and they are consistently fed low doses of antibiotics in order to keep them healthy so that um, humans can consume them after that. And these practices actually encourage the evolution of superbugs that will be increasingly resist resistant to modern antibiotics as we know it. So alternative proteins, on the other hand, doesn't require any antibiotics feeding in the process. It thereby eliminates the chance of zoonotic diseases developing and spreading. And, and alternate proteins basically gives us the opportunity to eat the same meats with the same taste, texture as conventional meat, but with a smaller envir environmental footprint and, and healthier option for us. Thank you so much. That's super um, uh, comprehensive. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll shift again the, the conversation uh, back to, to, to Matthew. Um, and um, you mentioned that, you know, Tenacious Ventures um, doesn't just cover Australia. So maybe this question can, can go beyond the Australian context. But um, also as someone deeply familiar with the agri-tech sector in Australia, um, maybe you could share with us some of the major successes that uh, you've seen Agritech help to achieve um, and whether this can be replicated or, or you know, um, applied to other markets looking for inspiration. Yeah, thanks, fascinating question. And I think, especially given 32% interest in uh, uh, climate resilient crops, I mean, if people know anything about Australia, they probably know that Australia is a, is a water resource constrained country. Um, we are agriculturally productive in a global sense, only something like 12% of food, but 60% of the food we produce is, is exported. Um, and as you know, the dry continent, um, we've always had a focus on agricultural research that has been designed, targeted largely at Australian farmers, like to make the farm, Australian farmers better able to cope with what was already a tough climate. I think what we're now understanding a lot better, and I don't know if people are watching uh, the news in Australia because there's a lot sort of more dire things going on, but Australia at the moment is suffering under you know immense stress from very significant, like absolute record-breaking rainfall at this point, um, which is not you know a, a typical problem for the dry continent. But what we're really seeing is that Australia sits on two or three decades of what we can reasonably call climate adaptive agricultural research. And so that becomes very interesting when we think about what that means on a global basis, that that understanding of, you know, all of the things that are necessary to have not just crop varieties, but production systems and methods and approaches that can be far more adaptive to and resilient to the larger peaks and larger troughs that we are going to have to produce food on the back of. Um, and so I think that that's, that's somewhat what we see at, as tenacious, that we, we want to have a global perspective in terms of the application of the technology, but we do expect a lot of the original innovation to be sourced in Australia because, you know, <laughs> I mean, somewhat the perspective has been inward looking in terms of we were largely doing it to make Australian farmers more efficient. You know, we're the second least protected agricultural economy in the world. Um, but the great benefit of that is, of course, that as, as there will be increasing demand uh, for a deeper understanding of this and how it, you know, how it applies in different geographies and different production systems, um, then we're very enthusiastic about that. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of combination of those two appeals that we see. Great, thank you for that, Matthew. Um, Right, so I guess um, I'll, 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 my, my next question is directed at Christine. And um, this question is talking about, well, you know, technological innovation is, is obviously important to resolve some of these challenges, um, but, but it's only one part of the equation. So um, maybe I'll, I wanna ask Christine and then Shuli the same question, uh, but uh, what do you think are the other important pieces of the puzzle to, to tackle this issue? And, and I know with your experiences in working with different stakeholders, I'm really interested to know more about um, the dynamics and, and working with, with these stakeholders. 
Sure. And just like a quick reaction to the points that Matthew made, I just wanted to say that this is indeed like exactly the approach that we're trying to take with our innovator community, which is, you know, the problems and challenges that we face are global in nature. Climate change is a global phenomenon, you know, the um, resource scarcity, et cetera, that we're facing around the world. Um, these are things we share because we're on one planet, but we do need locally relevant solutions that are contextual for the types of farms and the context, right, that exist in um, the different parts of the world. And so that's why it's so important to, you know, do this like trite statement of like, how can we collaborate globally and accelerate the sharing of knowledge and best practice, even failures so that we can learn from each other so that we can accelerate our local innovation efforts. And and this is um, something that digital tools are enabling um, that I think is really, really exciting. You know, not everyone has to start from scratch when they're, you know, developing an ag technology. Um, and, you know, how can we start to like really foster that collaborative global community? Um, that's something that I think about all the time. And there comes the other actors in the system besides just like the entrepreneurs or the investors, you know, there are other actors like policy leaders, for example, who can um, help create enabling environments for innovation to move forward. And I think it is, you know, um, in my experience, a very different world to be part of. And like I said, I've been part of the UN Advisory Committee last year for the Food Systems Summit. And, you know, for people like I work with on the day to day, and I consider myself one of them, like entrepreneurial people who are like, roll up your sleeves, like agile, nimble, let's get things done, let's experiment and fail forward. That's just like not how the world of policy works. There's a lot of like different types of stakeholders and a lot of very complex, you know, ways of working that makes sense for that space. But how can we link the worlds together is something I think is really, really important. And so the work, for example, GFI just, you know, um, released their report um, about like the acceleration of investment in the alt protein space. Um, they did a report, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now called, um, you know, APAC uh, opportunities. And it was about like, you know, new types of crops that could be brought into the alt protein space. These types of reports are extremely interesting to help shape discourse, right, and educate policymakers um, about these sectors that are like accelerating really fast. And then, of course, you know, come consumers that also need to be educated and brought on board. I saw there was like one question about this. You know, there's a whirlwind of change coming their way, and it's like hard to keep up with um, for the average consumer. And there's a lot of questions that they have. So I think it's really important, especially for, you know, science-based innovators to be able to um, engage a diverse set of stakeholders with, you know, different interests in this journey. We're in it together, you know, as they, that other comment is on spaceship earth, there are no passengers, we are all crew. And it's not, you know, we shouldn't be, um, it's all proteins versus livestock. It's, you know, big farming versus small farming. There's actually like all kinds of context and nuance and questions that need to be addressed. And how do we bring people into the conversation, find the spectrum of opportunities by exploring the nuance and building bridges between these different players. Um, and that's very complicated to do. It takes a little bit more time, but it's worth it in the end because we can move beyond polarized discussions where nobody wins actually, so. Thank you, Christine. Um, I think, uh, Julie, maybe you, you have something else to add. And, um, you know, Christine brought up the, the good point about policy and how sometimes the, the government world can be really slow and, and very reactive. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about in Singapore, because uh, as you mentioned earlier, we, uh, Singapore is the first country to approve the regulatory sale of cultured meats. Um, yeah, like how uh, you could talk a little bit more of, uh, from that perspective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Christine. You covered like a lot of ground and a lot of points that I wanted to make on the need for consumer education. That's super important because no matter how amazing the product is, consumers need to know the benefits of consuming these products over the conventional meats in order to um, make better choices in their, in their habits and their behaviors when it comes to shopping for food. And um, I'll just like to add two other points. So Ili mentioned um, the government perspective. Yes, so we really do need the government and the public sector to really back this 
um, evolving space, their support is really crucial because we need their support to accelerate R&D and in order to help these startups and these companies to scale their manufacturing and production in order to bring down the cost and to make alternative proteins accessible to more people so that it's not just something that only the elites can afford because that goes against the grain of the point of creating a system that is more just, more secure, more sustainable, and something that meets challenges like global hunger. A lot of people still don't have basic access to food or consistent supply of food, and that is a challenge that um, GFI and all our partners here on the panel today and elsewhere um, wants to address. So um, we think that this public support will be really important because there's a lot of tech advancements going on, but these tech advancements need to be leveraged in order to meet the projected protein demand in the future in the region and globally. And I would like to emphasize that there's also a need for intergovernmental collaboration. So Singapore has been great, really proactive in not only producing the first novel foods framework, regulatory framework, but also sharing it online so that other regulators, other countries, other partners can access it and use it as sort of a building block to, to kickstart their own their own development of their own regulatory framework or even to build on it. And while that is important, we also want governments and regulators to collaborate more in order to increase the ease of importing and exporting this alternative protein products or ingredients, because these um, products can be produced, but they do need markets to go to in order to reach the consumers. So I would say um, those that do uh, government support is super important. And I think the last point I want to make is um, the need for local talent. We do need local talent. We do need more talent in APEC to be interested in the all proteins field because that would be the only way to make this entire ecosystem sustainable. And um, we do need to educate consumers, but we also need to educate students. So GFI um, has started um, GFI Communities, which is a, a student community building initiative in order to get more students interested to expose them to all proteins and to um, get them to hopefully consider putting in their skills, whether it's policy skills, business skills, or side tech skills, to really move this industry and this ecosystem forward. Thank you so much, Julie. That's super um, engaging and interesting. Um, my next question is is for for Matthew, and um, I'm just gonna again, we're we're constantly shifting in this conversation, but that's what keeps it exciting. Um, to uh, talking a little bit more about the the agri food supply chain and. Um, I know generally it's it's divided into you know the upstream, which is cultivating and growing the food, midstream, which is processing and distributing the food, and then the downstream, the sale and consumption. Um, and I think from uh, in your perspective, which aspect of this value chain do you think most urgently needs more attention, more solutions, um, more engagement? Yeah, great. Thanks for the question. I. I'm going to give the political answer, which is to not answer the question directly. I, I actually think, and it goes to Christine's point about One Earth, um, I think actually some of the challenges with ag tech as an investment category have been that they have focused too much on individual segments of the supply chain. And the reality is that, that whilst there are individual participants in a supply chain, value flows along the chain. And the, it's, they're often asymmetric. In, in fact, value capture, or almost a defining characteristic of a food value chain is the asymmetry in value capture. And if the intervention into the, into the supply chain doesn't match that asymmetry, then it won't take. It'll, it'll fail because it's, it's not shared by enough uh, stakeholders or the economics of the target market can't support the transition on their own. Um, and so what we find, in fact, is the most successful transformative businesses have a business model that is a combination of an innovation which enables something new, but a business model that recognises fundamentally that normally there is a difference between the user and the beneficiary. And they are often separated along the supply chain. And if your business model doesn't capture the value for the beneficiary, but incent the take up by the user, then it's almost impossible to get to scale. And that's in fact what we have largely seen. And one of the reasons why um, venture style investing has had you know, uh, patchy success 
because a lot of the interventions have been too targeted. And so we really try and take that holistic view. We really try and look for founders who have uh, both the kind of innovation, like which creates the opportunity, but also the understanding and insight and an unreasonable uh, belief in a new version of, of you know, that part of, of one of the value chains in, in agriculture. Um, now that I've said all that, it sounds like a very abstract answer, so I'm happy to be more specific if, uh, if you want concrete examples. Yeah, maybe, maybe um, you, you could be a little bit more specific and, and also yeah, that, that great. kind of ties in with my next question, which is maybe, you know, is there any tension between investors and venture capitalists and the solutions, you know, like the, the capital side and the solution side? Um, what's the tension or the linkages uh, like? Yeah, I mean, just to say, give a quick example of, of just one that comes to the top of my head. Um, so, uh, you know, measurement of soil carbon is is a problem, right? It's it's a, it's 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 expensive, it's difficult, it's 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 slow, um, and so there's a lot of innovations there to make that faster. And um, there are plenty of ways of technology, you know, spectral analyzers and all sorts of things. And whilst it's true that that might make it quicker and faster, in and of itself. If you're just going to a farmer and saying, here, you can test your soil faster, you can find out your soil organic carbon level faster, that's not big enough to get to scale, right? What you really need to do is to work out, okay, you know, in the end, probably trading in offsets is not going to be what agriculture mostly does. Agriculture mostly is going to have to get to net zero X farm gate. And so very few farmers will have many to trade so the business model has to work out okay how do we get you know the players the millers the malters the food the processes the manufacturers who want all of those desirable characteristics in their food to ameliorate offset the cost extend and educate the farmers to take those things up because they're the ones who benefit because the food company or the retailer who wants to put these high provenance you know high sustainability products on the shelves recognizes the value of that because they're much closer to the person who actually pays um so hopefully that that kind of made that idea a little bit more concrete and i think the tension there is yes a sort of um we wrote an article uh sort of somewhat well our original jokey title was how silicon valley killed ag tech and the, the point really was that there was a lack of patience right there was a desire to sort of take existing templates it's like okay well there's 100 million farmers in the world and so we could just get farmers using their software on their phone and charge them a dollar a month and we'd be you know we're 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 off to the races um and i think the that is that was a bit of that early tension of the sort of it worked digital transformation worked that way over here and so you know we will just take that model and apply it over here and i think that that piling all that money in and just sort of building software after software after software ha actually had a, had a worse impact because people's eyes just started to kind of glaze over about all this kind of phone screen candy that really wasn't solving problems that they had. And I think to Shirley's point before, you know, like when you think about smallholder farming and, and how a, a collective of people can kind of get together and be informed about better decision making that they individually those kind of investments are, 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 are difficult. Um, I think that's really where digital transformation has promise, but you can't just go try and sell, you know, subscription software um, to, uh, to each farmer. And so I think that that's, you know, we're now seeing an awareness of um, those things needing to go uh, in lockstep. I see Christine like um um <laughs> really agreeing with that. I don't know if you want to add, add on to it, Christine. It's like music to my ears. It's something I champion all the time, um, not only to like the investment community, but, you know, to this policy world that I'm part of is that the typical like VC model is not fit for purpose for agriculture because there are different time horizons, 
um, you know, risk profiles, consumer acceptance issues, regulatory acceptance issues. And so, you know, coming in and applying like a software model, right. To ag tech is, is just not going to work and expecting exits in five years and things like this. When you have complex technologies, that need to be built. The value proposition need to be, you know, explained and understood, um, tested and deployed. Um, so we actually have built like in Thought for Food, a whole like module and training in our acceleration program called WTF, which stands for not what you might think it stands for, but stands for where's the farmer um, so that we can actually also like a lot of people from tech are coming in and being like, I can build an app, you know, to whatever, like provide geospatial data or, you know, um, analyze soils um, and the farmer's going to love it. And actually like they're not necessarily including the farm into their, um, you know, innovation process. So our module is really focused on like getting out there, you know, boots in the soil, talking to farmers, understanding their needs and, and their language and what their value proposition is and exploring new types of business models that don't make the farmers pay for everything. And actually I know Tenacious Ventures did a great article with, um, Marissa from Microterra, who was one of the teams we had the pleasure of working with, that really was like, you know, farmers making them pay for value and sustainability. They, they don't have the, their margins are so low. They don't have the, the money to do this. And so where, where, what are the new types of business models that we can explore where that value proposition is, you know, um, is clear and shared. And I think there's some really interesting angles in today's world. We're seeing companies vertically integrate, you know, we're seeing that a lot of consumer facing companies actually do want to tell a story to that conscious consumer, particularly millennials and Gen Z's who are willing to, um, you know, evidence shows put money where their mouth is when it comes to sustainability and pay premiums for products that they believe in. And so is there an opportunity to, um, you know, bring the value for some of the practices that uh, farmers adopt, you know, closer to the consumer, it's going to be hard because not every consumer is willing to pay. And we know that that's a complicated space, but it's worth exploring. And this is what in our acceleration program, we're really trying to push forward so that we're not just getting tech-based solutions that aren't fit for purpose for farmers and aren't going to make a dent on these. So I really, really appreciated, you know, Matthew's point and it's something I'm advocating a lot too. Thank you so much, Christine. I think it's it's really um, also timely because I've been having a lot of conversations with other um, um, uh, key opinion leaders in the ag tech space, and they all mentioned that yeah, there's so many um, technology for the smallholder farmers, but um, educating them is a, a huge hurdle, and it will continue to be a huge hurdle. And the cost of of trying to get them to, to use your solutions is also another huge hurdle. So um, that's a key message that we have to keep in mind. Um, so I am conscious of the time. I will just be asking the uh, the experts a few more questions from my list before I, I move on to the Q&A. Um, I'm really surprised by how fast time flies when we're having a, a really interesting discussion. Um, so maybe we can put on our um, crystal ball thinking hats and, and kind of think more about, you know, what's to come in the, in the coming years. And maybe I will, um, you know, ask truly uh, when we, uh, Christy touched a little bit on the consumer uh, perspective and, you know, especially the younger generations are very conscious with what they choose to buy and, and you know, basically choosing with your wallets. Um, and in terms of the consumption of alternative meats, how do you think it will be like in the future? Um, you know, how are maybe consumers reacting to it now? And is that an indication of how it will be like in the future? So we definitely hope that more consumers will consume alternative meats for sure. And um, yeah, so what comes to mind is a recent analysis done by McKinsey. There is a lot of uh, potential for cultivated meats, not only match, but to surpass the taste and texture of conventional meat and to introduce new and more novel products for consumers to give them more choices. And um, if consumers do take that up, then a the market could reach up to 25 billion just by 2030 alone, which is in the next eight years. And um, what I find really exciting in the next few years is that there could be so much potential 
where which cultivated meat can remove the constraints of current animal agriculture. For example, the industry could select the best cell lines for Wagyu beef or even a wild salmon and replicate them at the same cost as, for example, beef patties or common fish stocks like tilapia that we have today. And um, um, just to jump onto the point that you mentioned earlier on consumers, it's true like in Singapore and if we just look around globally, the positive trend is that more consumers are increasingly aware of sustainability and the need to incorporate or the desire to incorporate um, environmental considerations when they consume and when they buy things, including food. But the caveat is that GFI's research on consumer insights, which is open access so everyone can access it, um, has shown that no matter, <clears throat> sorry, no matter how much someone, a consumer, cares about the environment, what they will prioritize when it comes to food is still the taste, the texture of the food, and definitely the cost of the product because it needs to be accessible. So at this stage, we have more than 100 companies worldwide aiming to produce cultivated meat that's consumer ready to be eaten, but the industry can't move forward without the public support that I mentioned earlier in terms of regulations, in terms of funding to scale. So yeah, I think that's the little crystal balling that I have for the next few years. And I would love to hear thoughts from the other speakers or you. Great. Um, I, I, I just, okay, maybe in the interest of time, I just want to move on to some of the, the really interesting questions that um, our audience has been asking. So uh, there's one question from, from Ami uh, and he, he says, you know, enjoying the conversation on technology, innovation, and intersectionality in agriculture so far. And he is wondering how these challenges and opportunities uh, will play out in the domain of urban and development. And, um, you know, he's asking because cities will have to import more food and feed more people moving forward. Uh, the world is general, generally, generally uh, becoming more urban. Um, so, uh, and I see that Matthew has has answered a little bit. So I'm wondering if if uh, Shuli or Christine, or maybe Matthew, you can add on to um, answering the question. Well, I mean, I would just quickly add, like, I, um, I think this has to become quantitative, right? This whole this whole question of sustainability has to become properly quantitative. And when we when we talk about digitally native agriculture, that's what promises. And so that's why we talk about sustainable protein. Because I think, you know, it, the, the only reasonable measure can be that at population scale, it's, it's quantitatively sustainable along the lines of, you know, what we as humans care about because the planet will transform and other life forms will take over, right? But, but if we want to keep living on this planet, there's a pretty strict set of things that we're going to have to stick within. And, you know, below 1.5 degrees is probably one of them, right? And so I think when we think about urban, you know, it's still it's still a matrix of its energy, it's it's where does the water come from, it's where does the feedstock come from, um, and I think you know again technology is going to provide a lot of solutions there, um, but you know it'll be it'll be a combination of of solutions. And maybe just to jump into, I think like I get really excited about the potential for urban spaces to become, you know, hubs for food production and actually to think through, you know, how can we feed people more locally, more sustainably, um, and, you know, vertical farming, urban gardens, all of these places, like they have a model now, but where can this go? What is the potential of what this could be? How can we get more people thinking about this and connecting with their food system, you know, um, through these types of programs? And the other thing I just want to mention is that, um, you know, we talked about the importance of like bringing on board diverse stakeholders. Well, I have seen a really interesting model in Atlanta, in Georgia, um, and they actually had a um, official government position in the mayoral office that was focused on urban food security. And they were like looking at combating food deserts, which is a big issue in the U.S. That's like places where there is no like fresh produce and, you know, readily available. It's basically just fast food. But they what I loved about the model that they took was that they um, invited innovators and urban agriculturalists, of course, but they also invited architects and urban planners to create this new type of conversation about how do we solve like cityscapes for the future, um, integrating 
you know, food into the, the different, you know, aspects of how cities are being developed and designed. And I think like all of us can do more of that, not just in cities, but in rural areas, but everywhere. How do we bring in new disciplinary expertise and new perspectives into how we're developing solutions? Um, so I just wanted to like bring that out as a model, because I think like, again, if we think about scaling knowledge and best practice, that's a really interesting approach that I think more cities could take on board. Thank you, Christine. Sorry, Shirley, did you want to add something? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add from the Singapore perspective. So as we all know, Singapore is super small. We only have 1% of our land allocated for any sort of farming activities, and we import more than 90% of our foodstuffs to feed our population. So this um, issue of food security, this issue of how do we feed the growing population and the region is very pertinent for Singapore. And I think that um, this is where as I mentioned earlier, the whole time, ultimate proteins can really play a role because it makes sense for Singapore. We have this 30 by 30 plan. So by 2030, we would like to fulfill nutritional needs of our population by at least 30%. And how do we do that when we are not going to be allocating, for example, more land to farms? We're not going to be, and we also have to be conscious that we, um, while increasing this ability to produce more food, to grow local and to consume local, we also have to be conscious of the carbon footprint that we would produce from these agriculture activities. So I would, I, I would think that this would be a really interesting conversation on um, what do we, what we see in Singapore, for example, in the next decade. Would we, uh, when we go to the north, which is currently filled with farms like egg farms and chicken farms, will we be seeing bioreactors, more bioreactors producing cultivated meat, taking up very little land but producing huge quantities of meat? that can just travel from the farm to the fork in this really small city state with a very, very low carbon footprint. So really excited about that. And yeah, that's just um, me from the Singapore perspective. Great, thank you for that. Um, so our next question from uh, the audience, and this is from Jillian, uh, and she asks, how do we ensure that the food stock needed to make alternative proteins uh, does not create a problem elsewhere in terms of exacerbating water stress, land acquisition, and food security for lower income nations? And um, Shirley, uh, this is uh, most relevant to you, but the other, um, Matthew and Christine, please feel free to chime in as well. Yes, definitely. So when we want to introduce or to uh, promote alternative proteins as a climate solution, it definitely can't create those negative impacts that we're trying to mitigate. We, we want the supply chain to definitely be able to feed um, the global population, especially the lower income nations who don't have constant supply to food, especially pockets of them. And um, if we look at the existing data on for example, producing cultivated meat, it's true that it is uh, intensive in terms of water usage for example, and resource usage, but that is looking at it at the current point of production and not looking at its potential to scale. So I think that um, in all fairness, I think that it would be useful to think about um, what could we achieve if we have, for example, a, uh, we are able to bring the stakeholders together, the government, the policymakers, the industry, all these wonderful ideas from tech and innovation and to leverage on the scientific expertise that we have at our disposal to really be able to scale alternative proteins so that we can decrease the cost, dec decrease the, resource, the, the resources use, and to really be able to provide a supply chain, a protein supply chain that will not only feed Singapore, but beyond Singapore. I think that this um, question just highlights like what we've talked about today about the need to think through systemic solutions. We don't want to, as we transition to, you know, the plant-based future to replicate the models of the industrial era of monocropping and, you know, exploitation of resources or not including smallholders um, or, you know, exacerbating climate change. So it's really important as we're like building out these supply chains that we're thinking, you know, about um, these broader systemic impacts. And, um, and I think that's a huge opportunity for innovators, by the way, it's like, there's a great opportunity to jump in with a lot of the ag technologies that can be in support of crops that are used for 
um, you know, the alternative protein space and how regenerative ag, which is a big trend at the moment, I forgot to mention that one, um, and circular economy, but how those types of principles can be incorporated again in how these crops are produced, transported, and, you know, ultimately used. So there's just like, with all of the problems we face, there's a world of opportunities to solve them and to think differently in how we solve them and, you know, learn the lessons from the past. And one thing that always sticks with me is that everybody is like our food system is a failure and actually like, it's not a failure per se. Um, it's working exactly how we designed it to work. And when you think about that, it actually is like very empowering because it's like, we designed it, it's working how we designed it. You know, it's very like, it's delivering calories in, a, in an efficient way we can redesign it to be sustainable, regenerative, inclusive, and mitigating, you know, the problems that we currently face. So when you think about it through that lens, it's like, how can we redesign that and think about all of these things? Thank you so much, Christine. Um, in the interest of time, I, uh, it's been over an hour already. So I think I, I, I would really like to end our very, very insightful session with one final question. And um, this is something that uh, maybe you, uh, you could be a bit more cautiously optimistic about. Um, and my question is, you know, in one sentence, uh, what is one thing that you're excited about in the world of food and agri tech in, in 2022? Um, and I will start with Matthew first. Wow, one thing. Oh, look, I just think actually, Christine touched on it at the very start. We, we've sort of, you know, it's 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 agriculture's moment in the sun, and and with all the focus that we have and the obvious challenges people can see all around them, this is our moment, and that's very exciting. Perfect, um, Christine. Maybe you can you can go about what the future is. Sorry. Yeah, like uh, what's one thing that you're just excited about in about the, the world of food agri tech in 2022, something you're, you're um, you know, uh, looking forward to? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to, you know, having more diverse perspectives, you know, at the table, if you will, so that we can um, do new things in incredible ways. Perfect. And Shuli? I think for me, um, as a policy specialist, I would be really excited to see more regulatory advancements and harmonization across countries, because that would really, really help to enable and bring the entire industry forward. Perfect. These are, I, I love the responses. It's so, it touches on so many different elements. And um, uh, I, I think that's a great way to end our session. Um, uh, I think before we, we, we go, I, I really would like to thank the speakers again for their time to share their um, knowledge and expertise, uh, the audience for their really insightful questions and, and, and participation. Um, I think uh, one more thing is if we could just get a, a picture with the, with the speakers or a screenshot in, in our world of Zoom. Um, ben, I think you can take one anytime. Uh, maybe I'll just do a, a countdown. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm, I'm hoping he got he got the, the, the screenshot. But um, thank you again to to the the speakers and the audience. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, this is a a, a monthly session. Uh, very as you can see, it's a very relaxed chat. Everyone is so so enthusiastic with their responses. Next month, we will be talking about decarbonization. Um, and um, yes, we'll be publishing the dialogue and the transcript of today's event on our platform. So do look out for it. Um, and again, if you're keen to learn more about the livability challenge, please do click on the link um, below, uh, or I think it's in the chat box um, that Jeanette has pasted already. Um, but yes, thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful um, Friday, great weekend. Thank you so much to Matthew, Shuli, and Christine. Really appreciate your insights and sharing. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone in the next session.